What a blessing it is to be in the house of the Lord on another Lord's day. He is worthy to be praised. Oh, yes, he is. that you know you didn't deserve, you didn't work for, you didn't earn, and yet here we are this morning, we know our name, nobody had to wash us, nobody had to put our clothes on.
tell them and thank you for how good you've been to me and what you've done for me. How kind you have been toward me. Don't nobody know your story better than you. For he is worthy. Oh, yes, he is. Sometimes if you just ride along in your car and you start thinking about how good the Lord is. You start thinking more and more to write it down the side of your face. And then you call us your man or your son who looks in. You just glad and grateful for how good the Lord has been to you. I listen to Brother David's give my Sunday school lesson this morning. We say, you know what? I'm looking back and look at what the Lord allowed me to live to see and what he lived, allowed me to live through. He's the only one. The Lord has been good to everybody in here. Seen and unseen. He is worthy to be praised. For he is good. Yes, he is good. For he is worthy.
and verse 1, 2, and 3. Psalms 34, the 34th Psalm, verse 1, 2, and 3. When you find it, would you say amen? Amen. amen. I will bless the Lord at all times. Yeah. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Yes, it is. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Yeah. Let me read verse number four. I sought the Lord, I diligently yeah. prayed. He answered me. Yeah. Didn't have good news? Yeah, that's right. He didn't ignore me, but he answered me. Yeah. And not only did he ask me, but he did something too. Yeah. He delivered me yeah. from all of my fears. God with me if you will. Thank you, Lord. Father, we, we thank you today for who you are, for there is no one like you. Yes. We thank you for your grace and your greatness. Yeah. How you have time after time demonstrated your tremendous love toward us and for us. We thank you, Father, for being the Father that you are. We thank you that you have allowed us, Jesus Christ, to be your children. Yes. Please forgive us of our sins. We pray of deed, thought, and speech. Yes. Thank you that you have been so merciful and kind. And even when we were opposite of what you wanted us to be, we thank you that you never changed toward us. I pray for every person in this place today. I pray even for those that will watch this telecast. I pray for their families. I pray for the salvation of their household. I pray for their health and strength. Lord, I pray that you will hold us close to you, thanking you for this another chance to get it right. Let the words of our mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer, we pray. Amen.
preparation has passed me not. Oh, gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others now are calling, hear my humble cry. Hymn number 62, we'll sing the first and the second stanza of that tremendous verse. Would you say, 
I've been reading out of the New American Standard Version of the Bible. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day, there were added about 3,000 souls. Oh, yeah. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. They began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved may be seated <clears throat> today from that series of texts, particularly yeah. starting at verse 42. We want to talk about the signs of a healthy church. Okay. The signs of a healthy church. Yeah. If we were to poll the house of those of us that are present and even you who is watching my question would be, how healthy are you individually? What kind of condition is your physical, your emotional, your mental health is in? And of course, there would be a number of various different responses because being honest, everybody is not in the same place health-wise. And let's also be honest, we don't all take our health as serious as we should Amen. until, Amen. until. Amen. I don't know when was the last time you've been to the doctor for your annual physical exam. Maybe you don't see or sense the need of it. But any real care practitioner, your main physician, will let you know that it is your responsibility to be one who is in control of monitoring your own health and well-being. Once a year, there is what is we know at what is known as an annual physical exam, where for many of us, EKG, so many other things are taking place. Blood is drawn. Uh, our blood pressures are checked. Our hearts are checked. Uh, a series or a battery of tests are taken mm -hmm. so that when the results come back, we will be able to know where we stand on the good or the bad side of being healthy or unhealthy. Yeah. I think I would be correct in saying, let's just suppose that you went to the doctor tomorrow <clears throat> for your active physical exam. Or oh, better still, you went Friday. Yeah. Would have been enough time on the weekend for you to think about where you stand, mm -hmm. what your cholesterol levels look like, what your high blood pressure look like, and a host of other things that you might be taking medication for. And let's just presuppose that on tomorrow, the doctor's office calls. Mm -hmm. And they say what your name is. The doctor would like to see. He'd like to sit down and go over with you the results. You still with me? Yeah. Automatically, immediately, we are 
Some of us will be put on the edge. Yeah. Oh, Lord, have mercy. What do they find out? Yeah. Oh, Lord, what's wrong? I've already got enough stuff going on already. Sound like somebody in here? Yeah. And yet, depending on what the physician sees, based on what the results say, you and I know, we've been there enough times to know, it's either going to go well or it's not. We are either going to leave his office shouting and excited, or we're going to leave with some disappointment and possibility with some tears to flow and follow. Come here. I ain't talking about your physical doctor today. When was the last time the Lord gave you a spiritual health checkup? Question becomes for all of us in here individually what kind of spiritual health are you in? What has the Lord said to you about where you are in relationship to your spiritual health? Can I say to you today that if you are a part of a congregation, if you are a member of a church, while your physical health may not have an immediate impact on the membership at large, let me share with you, whatever condition you are in spiritually, yeah. it has an immediate impact on the health of that congregation. Yes. You still ain't walking with me. No one understand that whatever condition you are in spiritually, as the Lord has made complete examination and diagnosis, whatever shape you're in, if I can say it that way, has a direct impact on the church collectively. Yeah. Because you can't talk about the church without talking about you. And you can't talk about the health of a church without talking about what kind of shape are you in. Do you show up? Do you give anything? Do you even come to be present? Because whatever condition you are in today has much to say about the health and the well-being of the congregation totally. It's a body. Bodies have parts. Bodies have working components. And if a body is made up of individual parts, churches are made up of individual members. Right. And it's clear to see that when we talk about the church, it's important to understand we're talking about what kind of health are you in right now spiritually. Mm -hmm. And depending on what kind of health you are in spiritually, will say much about what the church looks like health-wise collectively. Yeah. It's amazing that our text, <clears throat> excuse me, begins and ends with a statement about the unusual growth of this church, this phenomenon. And included in this text is a list of at least four activities which the early church devoted itself to that served as signs of a healthy church. Mm -hmm. These tremendous qualities of the early church serve, I believe, as examples and models for the church today. That is, of course, if we are serious about the church's health and continued growth. I believe it's important that we take another look today at these four characteristics that are listed from verse 42 down to verse 47 that serve as signs of a healthy church. And in this cluster of activities, there are these four important actions and involvements of the church that were direct signs or symptoms of a healthy church. And not just then, even today. Yeah. These four activities of the early church also serve as priorities of the church. These are not add-ons. These are in direct proportion to who the people of God are even then and now. They made a steadfast commitment to doing these things, and as a result of their excitement and ongoing engagement of them, 
The bottom line is, when you get to verse 47 at the end, it says what the Lord did. The Lord added yeah. to their numbers daily such as would be saved. Now understand one thing. The Lord is not adding or would add to the church in the text who's not doing anything for him to add to. All right. Same principle applies today. If the church today isn't doing anything, and I'm not talking about social programs and a whole bunch of other stuff outside, uh, the, the body itself, I believe that the church has a responsibility to itself to grow, to nourish, to be nutritional, healthy from the inside out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you're determining the strength and the health of your church based on stuff you're doing outside of uh, what is in the Bible, you may be sicker than you realize. It's a whole lot of stuff that's attractive, but it doesn't necessarily make people grow closer to Jesus. Amen. Let me preach my old sermon and go home because so y'all want to sit down a moment. Four things. First, there is sound biblical teaching. You say, Pastor, why do you keep going back to this text? Because the Lord sends us back. Yeah. Why does God talk so much about sound teaching? Because there's a lot of junk out there. There are a lot of preachers that are not biblically cutting it straight. They're saying stuff that folk want to hear. And the most important thing is not what folk want to hear, is what people need to hear. Just like if you had an honest doctor, you, you, you ought to know by now that if he cares about your health and well-being, he's going to tell you the best and the worst because your health is at stake. The health of a church is based on sound biblical teaching. That there's an old adage, maybe, maybe this will excite you. There's an old phrase that says, you are what you need. A lot of people who have had clogged arteries you know, a lot of their diet on fast food stuff. Oh yeah, you know, I, you know, waffles are good. They taste good. And, you know, there are a whole lot of advertisements about who's got the best French fries. But you know what? They never, they never tell you what to expect health-wise if you keep eating that stuff. There are some people who have had great appetites for junk food while. Their bodies have had to pay for it. Yeah. Lord, have me preach your word today. You are what you eat. Let's talk about that because the intent of the phrase was not only to enlighten the person about the need to eat correctly, but it also served as, listen to this, a warning to avoid establishing unhealthy diet, regular eating habits. Because we need to eat. It's also important that we eat the right food that will provide and promote good general health. You remember when your mama made you eat the vegetables you didn't want? She knew what value there was in them, even when you didn't want. You don't think when we talk about the Word of God, that if we're on a regular diet of the Word of God, that God knows that that's going to strengthen us in advance. And, and if it's true when it comes to our physical bodies, how much more would it not apply to our health and development as believers regarding sound biblical teaching? The great commission of Jesus was to teach the world the gospel and the word of God. The problem is, in the life of the church today, it's not the great commission, it's the great omission. The great omission of the church of Jesus Christ today in many instances is to avoid teaching the word of God and to avoid sound teaching. Doctrine and teaching for the church is the heart of everything. And so the early church wasn't only a same church, but if you watch the text, they were also a word-centered church 
and they were a study in the church. The first sign of a healthy church is in its willingness to be taught the word of God. What do you look like today? What do you look like when it comes to your presence in Sunday school? What, is, what do you look like today when it comes to your presence in Bible study? What, oh, 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 preacher, I didn't come for that. Well, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what you came for. But if you are a healthy eater of the word of God, I'm walking right down your street. I ask you again, when you look at your spiritual health, no, when the Lord looks at your spiritual state of affairs, is he pleased? Are you? No, he can't make you. But you'll suffer in the end. And the church where you will attend will suffer as well. Weak people multiply together Make a weak congregation. The Lord did not say the strength of a church had anything to do with its finances or how many they got in it. You can have a building full of empty people. Lord, help me preach your word today. But, but, but thank you, Sister Little, for helping me today. That the content, the content of the apostles' teaching was the gospel. It wasn't the apostles' message. It was the apostles telling them about what Jesus' message was. And no doubt, th th there would be a good deal of emphasis on the fact of the saving work of our Savior. And that was the fulfillment of many of the Old Testament prophecies. Understand that Jesus had to be rejected, crucified, buried, and he had to rise from the dead because it had to fulfill the word of God. And the fundamental and foundational teaching of the early church needed to be heeded and understand. If you got a bad foundation, what you build on will not last very long. Come here, Jesus. I need some help right here. The last parable he taught when he dealt with that three chapter sermon in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the last illustration that he used had to do with builders. Yeah. One man built on sand, yeah. another man built on a rock. And while it looked safe on sand, all oh, but storms showed up, rain showed up, things came up against it, and Jesus said it collapsed. Brothers and sisters, mark it down. A church that is not built on sound biblical teaching will not last very long. Yeah. I didn't say the building, I said the people. Because if, if we don't cut it straight, you are something to be led by every wind of teaching that second. And I want to tell you, it's some liars on the internet. Oh yeah, it is. It's some folk writing because they want to make a buck, not because they want to tell you the truth. Preach past, I'm doing the best I can. The church stands strong and united. In as Paul writes to that pat to pass to Titus in chapter 2 and verse 1, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Here's something else. Write it down. Sound biblical teaching is needed in the church today. Yes, 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 yes. I was listening to Brother Davis teach this morning, so clear and yet so correct. That when we look at where we are in history as relates to the things that are going on, the church needs to have sound teaching. Amen. Sound doctrine affects more than teaching about the plan of salvation in the church. Sound doctrine and teaching affects your daily conduct that is a credit to God and to God's word. In other words, beloved, the more God's word that we know and live, the stronger in the faith we become. Yeah. Sound teaching positions and moves the people of God into spiritual growth and spiritual maturity because that's what happened even when they can't even see it, but there's something going on in their lives while their appetites change. Yeah. Lord, help me preach your word today. These insights and instructions in God's word enable the saints to be mobilized and equipped to mature in their faith. But it also helps them to be guarded against false teaching. Amen. 
It can hardly be overemphasized the importance of sound biblical teaching. We're living in a time when the church needs to be very clear when it comes to what God's word is saying about life and living. We're living in a day of alternative life and lifestyle. The church needs to stand against sin of all kinds. Lord, help me preach your word today. The word of God is the foundation and the starting point for every aspect of the Christian life. You take the Bible away from us, we don't have nothing. This is a lamp under our feet and a light on our pathway. You take the Bible away from us. And what do we have to model what Jesus looks like? You take the word of God away from you and I. It's not just about going to church. But you need to know who you come to church to see. I was wake up that morning. I was glad when they said unto me, let's go so we can look at each other. No, that ain't what the text is saying. We come so that we can encourage one another. But you and I have an audience of one. I pray that when you came to worship in this building or where you sit in the front of your smart device is that you need to know you and I have an audience of one with the Lord. Whether the building is full or whether it's half empty, the, 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 the Lord is in his holy temple. How much of him? All of him is in the hope. God is so great. Oh my Lord. Okay, can I just break it down? So real. God is so immense, so huge, so vast that the heavens of heavens can't contain him. But ain't he can miniaturize himself enough to meet us in this place. And so when we worship him, we ain't worshiping a part of God, we're worshiping all of God. It ain't just God's foot of his in here. God's presence is here. And that's why we ought to be respectful in the house. Because we know we come to worship him. Not some of him, not a piece of him, but all of him. Can I just keep preaching? Not only is there sound biblical teaching, when you talk about the sign of a healthy church. But secondly, another sign of a healthy church is they had fellowship. It's, it's amazing how Luke, who is the author of the book of Acts, this is his second work, the gospel named after him and the book of Acts, that when we come to this word fellowship, which is the Greek word koinonia, it has a larger term and a larger and a broader understanding than what we English eyes it. I know, I just made up a word. It'll be all right. Because fundamentally speaking, understand that when we look at the broadness and the depth and the strength of the word fellowship, it means, are y'all ready for this? Joint participation. Not separate alone stuff. It takes all of us together. Everybody in here ought to be of the same mind. Whether you are a serene, quiet worshiper, or whether you are an explosive, vociferous, I'm sorry, excuse me, vocal worshiper, we need both of them. Amen. 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 It ain't no matter who's staring at one. Oh, uh -uh, no, 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 uh -uh. no, no. I'm not asked to be like you. You're not asked to be like me. But don't take my individuality away from me in terms of our worship. And I will not be yours. But if we're on the same page, somebody ought to talk to me. And well, you know, I was watching, I was watching some excerpts of the game that they had yesterday in Cleveland. And when they hit a home run, I don't see folks in there. Like, I'm right now. Oh, no. Oh no, I saw people jumping up, hollering, screaming, spilling beer on themselves, and nobody getting mad talking about you owe me a cleaning beer. Oh, uh, in that celebrated moment, Lord, help me today. I thought I had about 10 folk in here. Yeah. In that celebrated moment, when their team was on the line and needing a win, and somebody came and hit a home run yeah. and put them up. Okay, since you're acting like you don't know what I'm talking about, when you were sick and it didn't look like you were going to get well, when you were in financial trouble and couldn't pay your bills, yeah, exactly. when you were going through sorrow and sickness, when you were despondent, despair, and depressed, yeah. and the Lord lifted your burden. Yeah. You offered you more than just 
the breaking of bread. Yeah. This church, not only were they a Bible believing church, not only were they a fellowshipping church, but they also had reverence and respect for he who is the head of the church yeah. by coming together and remembering what Jesus did. Yeah. Verse 42 says that they were breaking bread. It's really another synonymous term for communion or the Lord's Son. The symbol of fellowship here was remembering what Jesus did and died for us, paying the complete cost, and we got it free. That's where we all meet at the cross. Oh, yes. We all meet at the foot of the cross as lost sinners saved by the grace of God. I'm thankful that there is still room at the cross. It is the cross that brought our peace, reconciled us to God, and saved us by the grace of God. And it is the cross that becomes the symbol of our fellowship. Brothers and sisters, I'm trying to tell you that we are one with Christ because of the cross. Paul says we're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it is not I who live, but it is him who lives in me and he lives in you. And therefore, the cross is the symbol of our unity. And so every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we are acknowledging that the cross is our focal point and the magnet that brings us together. Yes, it is. But then, number four, and I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to need you to show up help me pray on this. They prayed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They prayed. Yeah. I look at the landscape of America and it's beyond disturbing. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have seen, you have heard, you have read reports about criminal activity that is just off the charts. Mm -hmm. Now, you would think the people who know he who has the power and got the answer to the problems that the people are facing, that the government, the president, the mayor, and nobody and the, no, nobody else in Washington can resolve. But the God who sits high, as grandma would say, and looks low, he who has the last word, he who can speak and men will live, he yes. who can speak yes. and men will lay down and die. Yes. That God who helped us, who saved us. Yes. You would think that because we got that much authority and power in the presence and person of him yes. who is on our side, yes. that if he will, if we will gather and pray that God will get busy doing some stuff, you would think by now that we would have been getting together and praying. No. The early church found a secret that's available to every church in America. Yeah. The early church was a praying church. They were engaged in unified collective prayer. It wasn't a matter of, well, we're going to stay home and then we'll call on God. No, no. Um, no, we're going to get together since we are a body of believers and call on he who is the head of the church. This body of believers banded together in prayer. Yes, they were newly saved believers who were just beginning to get the understanding and the significance of what was going on, but they made the time and took the time to pray. And now since they came to the Lord for salvation, bless his name, a new perspective on an old act took on a new and different meaning and purpose called prayer. Because so it happens after prayer. They were engaging in prayer, watch this, not just for themselves, but they were in prayer for one another. They learned to appreciate the need and the importance of praying for one another in their fellowship. They learned what it meant to be a body of believers, and in that body, there were people that had needs beyond themselves, and they gathered together to call on the Lord to pray for one another. Oh, I want to tell you, 
We need the same kind of prayer and concern for one another in prayer today. Oh yes, people are still in spiritual bondage. We need to be praying for their deliverance. Lord, help me preach your holy word today. And how comforting and yet how encouraging it is to know that not only are there saints praying, but they are also praying to God on the behalf outside of themselves. Right. It's a great thing to know that when you lay down tonight, that in the fellowship where you are a part of a body, that there's somebody calling out your name to God in prayer. Amen. Oh, yes. I tell you what I need you to do. I need you to look on your road to the left and the right. And the night when you get home, I want you to call out their name in prayer and ask God to help them. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that good news? Yeah. And, and when you know that you got somebody who is calling out your name in prayer, yeah. I'm crazy enough to believe that God will get active, bend his ear low yeah. to hear somebody's cry yeah. on your behalf. I, I, I tell you, oh yes it does work. Uh, some of us, all of us in here are recipients of the prayers yeah. of some saints that are no longer around. Yeah. Uh oh, okay, okay. You can write like that. Okay. No, you can make it this far because you're smart, pretty, lucky, or you got three inch dimples. It ain't got nothing to do with that. No, your mama prayed for you, yeah. and your grandmama prayed for you. Oh, come on, I, 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 I feel a celebration coming on right now. You know, it would be an awesome thing if your mama or your grandmama or your or other members of your family who prayed for you, and they can walk in the building right now and see where you are. Baby, I pray that the Lord would save your soul. I, I pray that you would come to Jesus. Son, I pray that you would give your life to the Lord. Some, uh, we, all of us sitting up in here, we didn't always pray for ourselves. Thank God that there was somebody that was praying for us. And if somebody prayed for us, we ought to be praying for our children. We ought to be praying for our grandchildren. We ought to be praying for folk that we know that are unsaved today. Lord, help me preach your holy word. If there's anything that you could ever want out of a church, it ought to be that you want to be a part of a praying body of people. Our oh, bless his holy name. Yes, prayer is the slipping air that moves the muscle of our omnipotence. In other words, it is our prayer that activates God's power on our behalf. And if you if you can if you can get enough people praying, then you're going to activate God's power. Now, I know I got a witness further in the book of Acts when Peter and when Peter got put in prison. The word says that the church, Sister McMillan, went on a prayer mission. Yeah. And they just kept on praying. It didn't matter how long, if it was all night, they kept on praying. And, and the fact is, is that when God answered their prayer by sending Peter back to the place where prayer was going on, y'all missing what I'm saying. Peter didn't get out of prison and then go home and start watching the next week of you. Now, Peter went back to the place where the folk were praying for him and wanted to be a part of the praying moment. And that young lady named Rhoda, when she heard a knock at the door, Lord, keep my mind clear while I preach your holy word. And there was a knock at the door, and she said, sound like Peter went back to the place where the church was praying. And they said, girl, you don't know your mind. Peter is still like a knock. Peter is at the gate. I want to say to you today that when God sings your deliverance, you ought to have enough sense to tell him thank you. When God gives you my answer, you ought to celebrate. When God gives you a breakthrough, you ought to let him know that you thank him for what he has done for you. They came together. Oh, bless his holy name. They didn't have a building. 
that he's not done sending blessings. Yeah. Praise God today that if he will add then, he'll add now. Praise God today that he is not done. I'm talking to somebody who came today not knowing how things are going to work out. But I want to tell you, as we used to sing, turn it over to Jesus. And he will make it all right. Oh, yes, I, I thought he had some children in the house today that know that there is power in prayer. Oh, yes, it is. But there's also power in him that answers prayer. He, he's got all power in his hand. Am I right about it? He is a God that you cannot hurry. He may not come when you want him, but he's always. I ain't gonna do that. He's always. He ain't never late. He knows what you need, and that's why you ought to be a praying person. Praise God that He is a way maker. Praise God. Praise God. He is one to give peace of mind. Praise God. He will bring you out. Praise God. He will stand by your side. Praise God. I know somebody else will stand up. That He will do what He said. Is there anybody here? Is there anybody here that knows for yourself that I believe? Witness that prayer will work. That prayer does work. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. He will do it. Do you know it? Do you love it? Do you know it? Won't he do it? Won't he bring you through? Won't we lift you up? Can I hear you say yes? Thank you. Thank you. I owe you. Thank you. You've been good to me. Thank you. You took the lights on Sunday. Thank you.
this morning started me on my way to praise God. I had a roof over my head. Praise God. And it comes to come to my nation. Just praise God. I had a refrigerator with water in it. Praise God. Shoes on my feet. Praise God. Today. And if you ask him, he will. 